Hello. In this lecture, we're going to learn some of the basics about the settlement and consolidation of soil under an induced stress. So, in the past few weeks in our 341 class, we've discussed we've been discussing a lot about different types of stresses. We've introduced the idea of geostatic stresses. Remember that these are the stresses that the soil is feeling due to its own weight or to the weight of the soil above it. We've also introduced the idea of induced stresses. Induced stresses are the stresses that we add to the soil because we're building something, whether a new embankment, whether a new dam or levee, or a new building that we're putting on the soil. So one of the things that geotechnical engineers are interested in doing is predicting how the soil is going to deform vertically when we apply these induced stresses. When we, if we want to predict what these deformations are called, these, these vertical uh, deformations are, are what we refer to as settlement. There are three types of settlement that occur in soil and that we have to consider as geotechnical engineers. The first settlement is what we call elastic or immediate settlement. An elastic or immediate settlement is due to the elastic distortion of the soil particles themselves. So we're looking at the solids of the soil, and if we load the soil up, those solids in the soil are going to deform elastically. It's just the exact same concept if I had a steel bar here, and I applied some sort of load to the top of the steel bar. You can imagine then that that steel bar is going to have some sort of deformation. And that deformation that occurs would be, of course, the settlement or, or the, the deformation elastic in the bar. Um, same type of idea with soil. Now, this type of settlement occurs instantaneously, uh, typically right when we apply the load. So usually it occurs during construction. And the primary cause for this settlement, uh, or I should say this is the primary mechanism of settlement for coarse grain soil. That should be an A. For coarse grain soil. So this is like sands and gravels. Now the second type of settlement that um, I want to introduce has to do more with the void ratio of the soil. And this is what we call primary consolidation settlement. Um, designated with this S sub C. Now, as we apply a load, if um, uh, imagine if I had a sponge, and if I squeeze the sponge, the sponge may be filled with water. All of the water is sitting in the void space inside that sponge. That sponge, if it's going to compress at all, it has to push some of the water out of it. And so it's the same idea if, with soil. If the soil is going to settle or compress, it does so by pushing water out of the void space. And so there's a loss of volume in the soil. And the rate that this water gets pushed out depends on the hydraulic conductivity and the thickness of the soil, as well as where the drainage layers are located relative to this, this soil layer that's consolidating. Um, so depending on these, these factors, um, it could require anywhere between months to years for primary consolidation settlement to occur in a given soil. Now this is the primary cause of settlement for fine grain soil. So um, clays and uh, some finer silts. The last type of settlement that I want to introduce is called secondary consolidation settlement. Now this is the settlement that occurs um, constantly over time and it's due to the breakdown or the degradation or decomposition of the soil particles themselves. And so we get these long-term distortions of the grains and it, it has the appearance of like a plastic creep type deformation. Um, and <clears throat> these types of settlements can occur years after primary consolidation is finished. And they're particularly <laughs> um, uh, common in soils that have high liquid limit and high moisture contents, uh, as well as soils that, that are organic. So soils like peats or, or other organic type soils
where there's a lot of um, chemical decomposition going on that's changing the structure of the particles themselves. So in this uh, lecture, we're going to talk specifically about these two types of settlements, and we're going to save this settlement for uh, a later lecture. Let's talk first about uh, immediate settlement. Like I said before, we're likening immediate settlement to the compression of a bar. If I press down on the, on the axial uh, direction on a bar, we expect to see that a, a portion of this bar is going to squeeze out laterally as the top squeezes down due to our load. Um, this elastic or bulging effect is called the Poisson effect, and it's, it's what is typical with immediate settlement. So all of this behavior is occurring in the individual soil particles themselves. So please understand that immediate settlement has nothing to do with the void space of the soil, but it has everything to do with the solids in the soil. So think of the solids acting like a steel bar that we're compressing or loading. There's going to be some amount of elastic deformation and if I let the load go, you can imagine that the particles are going to bounce back and rebound to where they were before their original size. Now, all soils are subject to elastic settlements. But engineers typically neglect these types of settlements in fine-grained soils and only consider them in the coarse-grained soils. And the question you might ask is, well, why? Why do they do that? If this occurs in all types of soils, why do we only consider it in fine, or I'm sorry, in coarse grain soils? Well, the main idea is because primary consolidation settlements govern the settlement behavior in fine grain soils, typically. So uh, the, the primary consolidation settlement um, dwarfs the elastic settlements in clays. And so usually we just kind of lump the elastic settlement into the calculation of primary consolidation settlement. But you got to be aware that this is a sticky issue for a lot of geotechnical engineers. And in my personal practice, I have seen geotechnical engineers estimate elastic settlements from clay type soils and others that say, nope, I'm only going to estimate it for coarse grain soils. So my, uh, the moral of this story is do not be alarmed if in practice you see different types of things being done in estimating settlement. You're going to get about the same answer regardless of what is being done. Uh, the point is you want to see at least that fine grain soils are being computed for primary consolidation settlement and um, coarse grain soils are, be computed, are being computed for elastic settlement. Now, for the purpose of <coughs> this class, we are only going to consider immediate or elastic settlements in our coarse grained soils, so our sands and our gravels. We're not going to worry about them in fine grain soils. How do we calculate immediate settlements? Well, I'm going to introduce two ways to you. The first way is to use a theoretical equation that's based on elastic theory. So this equation right here is a popular equation that uh, is used or, or uh, a lot of different transformations of this equation, but they all basically say the same thing. This, this equation is still based on the idea of um, of PL over AE computing the deformation like in a steel bar. It's the same idea. We have elastic modulus, we have Poisson's ratio in here, we have the load um, as well as the effective area that's being loaded, and we also have some shape factors that we may want to account for as well as depth factors that will uh, uh, affect the stiffness or elasticity of the soil. Um, so you'll notice that uh, this Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio, they have these little average terms under it. What does that mean? Well, uh, that basically means that if I have, uh, say, the ground surface right here and I have my load applied to the ground surface, we learned under induced stresses that there is basically a bulb of stress 
that extends down beneath the ground. And we talked about we're really interested only in the zone of stress that is 20% of our Q up here applied on the ground surface or greater. So anything beneath this bulb or outside of this bulb of influence right here, we are not really interested in. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is if I have multiple soil layers under here, say I have a gravel and say I have a sand and then another gravel or something like that, I want to compute the, uh, the elastic settlement from each of these layers. Now each of these layers also have associated thicknesses like H1, H2, and then, you know, if, if this was my stress bulb, whoops, if this was my stress bulb for my 20%, uh, then I'm only interested in the thickness of that, that last gravel layer that uh, still falls within my zone of significant stress. Um, and then you can imagine that each of these layers also has its own corresponding properties like Poisson's ratio and Young's modulus. Uh, the sand could have its own properties and this gravel down here could have its own properties. So the idea well, how we compute these average values is we're going to use what's called a geometric mean. So how do we compute that? Well, uh, for instance, the average Poisson's ratio is simply going to be the summation of all of the thicknesses of our soil layers within the zone of significant stress. So in this example, it would be H1, H2, and then this little H3 portion that's within our zone of significant stress. And we're going to divide that by the summation of the ratio of our thickness of each layer divided by its corresponding Poisson's ratio. So that's going to give us a, a weighted average Poisson's ratio to use to plug into this one equation. Um, a similar equation then for Young's modulus is going to be the summation of the thickness of each uh, layer divided by the summation of the ratio of the thickness to the Young's modulus for each layer. <clears throat> so that's how we're going to compute uh, our weighted averages to plug into this equation right here. A couple other things to point out. If you want these shape factors here, we can get them from um, equation 11.2 and tables 11.1 .1 and 11.3 in our DOS textbook. Okay, so this is the first method we can get to compute immediate settlements in sands or gravels beneath an, an induced load. Now, I'm going to introduce the second method, but one thing I want to talk about really quickly, how in the world do we get these values? I mean, it's not like we can just go out into the field and magically measure the Poisson's ratio or the Young's modulus in the soil. How do we measure those in the soil? The most common method that we use to measure any property in the soil is we use what are called in situ tests. In situ tests are tests where we can put instruments down into the ground and measure the properties of the ground right there in the field and not take anything back to the lab. One of the most popular, oh, before I do that, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention something very important. And my animation reminded me of this. When you use this theoretical equation, please make sure that you use consistent units. <clears throat> this equation is dimensionally correct, so you got to make sure that your units work out and everything cancels out, otherwise you're going to end up with some screwy numbers. Okay, back to in situ tests. One of the most common and popular tests that we use today is called the standard penetration test or the SPT test. In the SPT test, we drill a hole in the ground just as like is depicted um, in this little drawing here. Then what we do is we lower a rod down into the ground that has a sampler on the end of it. Now this sampler 
is basically just a pipe that is about a, a foot and a half to two feet long. And basically what we do is we drive this pipe into the ground using a 140 pound hammer that we drop over a distance of 30 inches. And what we're going to do is as this hammer falls and hits this anvil and drives this pipe into the ground, we're going to count how many times the hammer has to hit the anvil to drive it one foot into the ground. So usually what we do is we, we count this thing in six inch increments. So we count um, how many hammer blows it takes to get this six inches, and then how many to get this six inches, how many to get this six inches, and if we drive it the full 24 inches, how many to get that six inches? And then we add together the last, uh, the blow counts from the last two six inch sections, and that gives us the SPT resistance. We found that SPT resistance correlates pretty well to the relative density of the soil. So if I get an SPT resistance in the field anywhere between zero to four, I've got a really loose soil. It has a relative density between zero to 15%. Uh, conversely, if I get uh, SPT blow counts greater than 50, I have a very dense soil, something between 85 to 100% relative density. So once we drive this sampler into the ground, we retrieve it, we pull it out, and the cool thing about this sampler is that it actually um, can break in half. The sampler opens up and that allows you to pull out or retrieve the soil sample that's in the middle or, or trapped within that little pipe. And so you can take that soil sample back to the laboratory and perform index testing on it like sieve analysis or Atterberg limits if you have fine grain soil, or even some hydrometer tests if you'd like. Um, the thing to be careful about though is that that soil is definitely disturbed. So test where you, you want undisturbed soil samples. You are not going to um, use samples obtained from a standard penetration test. So anyway, you know, this little uh, cartoon here showing a guy with a cat head and a rope and a pulley manually making this hammer go up and down. Uh, that's really old school, but it, it just shows how the test was originally set up. If you um, type in this address right here, you'll be able to go to a video which shows um, a live recording of an actual SPT test today. And they're using a modern hammer that's called a safety hammer and it's all completely automated. So um, we can use the SPT test to correlate Young's modulus for a soil layer, to correlate Poisson's ratio for a soil layer, and lots of other types of soil properties. The problem is, because we're not directly measuring these properties, there's going to be a lot of scatter in these correlations, so you have to be aware of that. Now the second method that we can use to calculate immediate settlements in coarse grain soils is an empirical method developed by an engineering legend called Meyerhoff. And this uh, method is based on the average SPT resistance for the, the coarse grain soil in the zone of significant stress. So uh, again, like we did before, the average SPT resistance is simply going to equal the thickness of the soil layers in our zone of significant stress divided by the ratio of the thickness of, the, of each layer divided by its corresponding SPT resistance value or average SPT value of that layer. And that's how we get that average value. And we stick that into this equation and we can apply the load for that's a, a, on our uh, footing and we have width. Remember width is the short end or the short width of our load. L is the long width of our load if it's a rectangular load. Uh, of course B and L will be equal to each other if we have a square load. Where did this uh, method come from? Well Mayerhoff what he did was he collected hundreds of 
of actual settlements from actual footings where he knew the low that was applied to the footing. He knew that there was sand beneath the ground. He knew what the SPT resistance was of that sand before the footing was constructed and he developed a statistical correlation. Now you got to be careful, right? Because I mean, essentially what he was doing was saying, okay, here's SPT resistance, here's settlement. The lower the SPT resistance, the higher the settlement in my footing. And so he fit a line through there. And, and that's what this equation essentially represents. But you got to be careful because um, there's scatter in this data. So I said if I were to look, you know, the likelihood of the data being around this uh, regress line is pretty high, but there is a, a chance <coughs> that data can lie far away from this line. So anytime you use empirical methods, that's something that you have to be aware of. One thing that I want to point out that you need to be careful of, this is an empirical equation, and it is not dimensionally correct. That means that when you use this equation, Q has to be in units of KSF. B, the footing width, has to be in units of feet, not inches, feet. Settlement will be computed in units of inches. Wait. Even if I plug feet in for, for the, my footing width, you're telling me the number that spits out is going to be inches? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. That's what I mean by this equation is not dimensionally correct. So make sure that you use the units that Mayer Hoff is assuming here in this equation. Okay, so that wraps things up with um, elastic settlement. Now I want to spend some time and I want to talk about consolidation settlements in clays. And um, to introduce this idea, I want to go to the whiteboard and introduce this idea if, um, imagine if we had a piston. And in this piston, oh, don't want to do that, let's see. And in this piston, imagine we filled it up with a whole bunch of water. Now you can imagine that um, if this uh, piston was truly closed here, like this, that if there's no way for the water to escape, the piston's not going to move because water is essentially incompressible. But what would happen if I took then um, and I placed a spring inside this piston, but still left the piston completely sealed and closed. Now again, if I apply any load to the piston, all of that load applied to the piston is going to be taken by the water. And the spring is not going to deform at all. And if the spring doesn't deform, that means the spring doesn't take any load. If the spring doesn't take any load, that means the spring doesn't even feel the load that's being applied to the piston. But if I come in and say I poke a little hole right at the bottom of my piston such that water now starts to drip out. Here, we'll erase that water up here. There you go. Now as water starts to drip out, of this piston slowly, what's going to start happening is that this piston is going to start moving down because water is escaping. As the piston starts moving down, that's going to start deforming this spring right here. And as we start deforming that spring, the spring is going to start pushing back. That's what happens when you deform springs. Now eventually what's going to happen is that the more this piston goes down, the further it goes down, because more and more water escapes, the spring is going to take more and more and more force until the force in the spring equals the force that we apply to the piston. And then the piston's going to stop going down, at which point the water is going to stop flowing out of the piston because we have a vacuum effect and it's going to keep all the water inside and everything will be in equilibrium. Now, 
if I apply an additional load, like a, a second load, I don't know why it keeps uh, making a crooked little arrow there, but if we apply another load to my piston, initially that load is going to be taken by the water because the water is going to try to get squeezed out again, but it can't get squeezed out fast enough. So the water is going to take that load initially, but as the water drips out and the piston begins to move down some more, the spring eventually will take the load that's been applied to the piston. And what I'm trying to say is that this analogy, this analogy with the piston and the water and the spring is, is representative of what goes on in clay or fine grain soil in the ground. In this particular case, the spring represents the clay particles. The water represents the water that's in the void space in the clay. The piston represents the induced load right here that we're applying to the top of the ground. And the little drip of water represents the water that's escaping into the drainage layers that may be bounding or surrounding the clay layer, either below it or above it. So in other words, uh, we, we can look again at these analogies here. At time equals zero, when I apply this force P to my piston, immediately, or actually this force right here, <coughs> initially the water is what's going to take that load. But as that water slowly starts to escape through the little drip release that I have, the water is going to take less and less and less of the load. So I have a plot here. I have time, and here's my applied force P on the piston. Now something needs to hold that piston up, or the piston is just going to move down, 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 down forever. Something needs to resist it. So I'm saying at time equals zero, the water is resisting all of that load. But as water drips out, the water pressure inside of my piston here is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So something's got to be making up for that, and that's going to be the spring. So as the water drips out, my spring starts taking more and more load uh, from the piston, such that at any given time, the summation of the um, force taken by the spring and the summation of the force taken by the water, if we add those together, it's going to equal my applied force, P. Here's another way to think of this. Let's just look at a real problem. Let's imagine here that I have this clay layer and it's bounded by sand on the top, it's sand on the bottom, and it's saturated. And now I'm coming and I'm applying some uniform stress, uh, an induced stress, infinitely across the whole top of the site. <clears throat> Imagine I'm just dumping a whole new soil layer on top of the ground. So what's going on? Well, um, here are some plots on the right. The y-axis here represents this thickness of the clay such that this H here represents the total thickness of my clay. When I apply my induced stress, that's going to induce a brand new stress, a total stress equal to delta sigma in my soil. Something's got to take that load. And at time equals zero, um, when the clay starts to feel compressed, the water that's in the void space is going to be the first thing that's going to push back. So the pour water pressure is going to increase by an amount equal to the induced stress that I put on my soil. And we call that U naught. That's the initial increase in pour water pressure in my clay layer. And interestingly enough, the clay particles themselves are going to feel nothing. They're going to feel no increase in stress because the water is taking all of the load. We call this no consolidation. No consolidation has occurred yet. But 
What do you think is going to happen to the water? Well, this water that's in the pore space wants to get out now. It's pressurized and it wants to find an exit. So it's going to start draining out into the sand layers, both above and below the clay layer. And the first water droplets that are going to escape are going to be, of course, the water that's the closest to the sand. Such that at, if I look at any time greater than zero, the water that was at the top of my clay layer and the water that was at the bottom of my clay layer got out. It's not pressurized anymore. And because it's not pressurized anymore, the poor water pressure at that location is equal to zero. But I still have to offset the total stress that I applied through my induced load. Therefore, if the pore pressure went down, effective stress had to go up. That's, uh, remember, that's analogous to the spring beginning to deform and beginning to take the load that we applied on our piston. So at the edges of my clay layer, the effective stress goes up. But notice at some time um, greater than zero that I still have a significant amount of pore pressure in the middle of my clay layer. And the reason for that is because a drop of water at this point has a really long way to go, either up or down, before it can get out of the clay. So that's why it retains that pressure for a long amount of time. And that's why I have little effective stress in those portions of the clay. So in this scenario, we call this partial consolidation or consolidating. The soil is consolidating. <clears throat> now if we come back at some time infinity, after all the water has had a chance to drain out, we're going to see that there's going to be no more excess pore water pressure in the clay. The only pore water pressure that will be in the clay is the hydrostatic pressure just from the weight of the water itself. But the water is no longer carrying any of this induced stress that we put on the soil. So what is carrying it? The effective stress. The soil particles themselves are now carrying the weight that we just put on there. So what is primary consolidation? My friends, primary consolidation is the mechanism of transferring a newly applied stress from the pore water to the soil skeleton. That is primary consolidation. And when that happens, then we say that full consolidation has occurred. So when we want to uh, predict the properties of consolidation settlement, there's two things we're really interested in. We're interested in how much settlement is going to occur, and we're interested in how long it's going to take for that settlement to occur. So the way that we can predict this is we need to go and obtain a sample of the clay as undisturbed as possible and bring it back to the lab and we're going to simulate loading this thing with an induced stress. So we take that clay sample and we stick it inside of a steel ring and then we put the steel ring inside a water bath and we put below it a porous stone and we put on top of it a porous stone. These porous stones simulate sand drainage layers so that water that is being squeezed out of our clay sample can get out without a problem. <coughs> on the top of the stone we put this dial here and we're going to measure how much the soil sample consolidates or how much the sample settles when we apply different amounts of load. Such that if I were to plot uh, for one given load time on a log scale versus how much deformation occurred in my soil, I would see this type of behavior. Initially it would start out kind of slow and then it would speed up, speed up, speed up and then it would slow down again. This steep part of this curve is what we call primary consolidation and that's what we're interested in. In the next lecture we're going to talk about what to do with this second stage, uh, secondary consolidation. <clears throat>
So what we want to do is we want to take this soil sample. Here's the cross section again of just the soil that's inside of our disk. And I want to convert that over to a phase diagram. So I have solids right here. And I have voids right there. And what I want to do is with each load that I apply in my test, I want to measure how much deformation is induced in the soil. And the more load I put on the soil and allow to consolidate, the more deformation <clears throat> is going to happen because I'm going to squeeze more water out of the voids and the volume of the voids is going to diminish. What do I do with this information? Well, I plot what is called a consolidation curve. A consolidation curve shows the change in the void ratio of our soil sample with the change in the um, effective stress that we're applying to the soil. The change, actually, I'm sorry, not the change of the effective, the change of the load that we're applying to the soil. And so what we can see is that there's some initial void ratio. <clears throat> and as we continue to increase the stress, we can see that the void ratio eventually starts decreasing substantially because we're squeezing more and more water out of the clay. So these equations right here are very useful to go from properties that we can measure in our consolidation test, like the height of the solids or the weight of the solids, and take it all the way to computing a void ratio for the soil. So um, these equations will be helpful to you if you need to develop a consolidation curve from a lab test. <coughs> So let's zoom in and look a little closer at what a consolidation curve is. There's a few things I want to point out. First of all, notice that there's this point on the plot where the slope has a really stark change. There's a slope right there, there's a slope right there, and that stress seems to indicate the load at which we change that rate of void ratio change in our soil. We call that stress the pre-consolidation pressure, or sometimes called the maximum past effective stress. We denote it with sigma prime p, or sometimes sigma prime c. This stress represents the maximum effective stress that the soil has ever felt in its existence. As long as the soil has maintained this soil fabric, it is a record of the highest stress that that soil has ever felt. Even if it was thousands and thousands of years ago, that information is still recorded in the soil. Okay, next we want to look at what we call the over-consolidated portion of the curve. Over-consolidated means that the current effective stress is less than sigma prime p. So if I'm anywhere on this portion of the curve, the stress that I'm at currently, say right there, is less than sigma prime p. That means that my soil is over consolidated. Now, <clears throat> what if I'm on this portion of the curve? We call this portion the virgin compression line. And this means that, say, this was my point that I'm at right now. This point is higher than my soil's previous pre-consolidation pressure, which means, by definition, that the stress that I'm currently at is the largest stress that the soil has ever felt. So if my current effective stress is equal to the pre-consolidation pressure, then the soil is what we call normally consolidated. So I have two types of clay. I have over consolidated, meaning that the soil has felt a larger amount of stress in its past than it's feeling right now. Or I have normally consolidated, which means the soil is currently feeling the largest amount of vertical stress it's ever felt in its existence. Now, a very useful ratio that we can use <clears throat> 
um, is called the overconsolidation ratio or the OCR. So again, the OCR is equal to the pre-consolidation stress divided by the current effective stress in the soil. If the current effective stress is less than the pre-consolidation pressure, then the OCR is going to be greater than 1, which means the soil is over-consolidated. If the current effective stress is equal to the pre-consolidation pressure, then the OCR is approximately going to be equal to 1, and we say the soil is normally consolidated. <clears throat> so let's do a little test. If I'm on portion line B of the consolidation curve, is the soil over-consolidated or normally consolidated? If you said over-consolidated, you're right, because our current stress is less than the pre-consolidation stress. Now, in this portion from point B to point C, you can see that it's very curvy. This is what we call the transition zone from over-consolidated to normal consolidated behavior. Now what's going to happen if I'm on this point between line C and line D? Am I over-consolidated or am I normally consolidated? If you said normally consolidated, you're right. We're on the virgin compression line, which means that our current stress is now the new pre-consolidation stress. But what would happen if I went down to say point D and then I started to remove the load in my test such that the soil is now feeling less stress than it had previously. Well, my consolidation curve or my void ratio would follow a plot or a path that looks like this. And notice how that path is very similar to the path above. That's because now I am in recompression. I'm on what's called the rebound curve. Am I over-consolidated or normally consolidated if I'm on that curve? If you said over-consolidated, you're correct because point D, that stress associated with point D, is now my new pre-consolidation stress from my test. <clears throat> How do we find the pre-consolidation pressure? One of our geotechnical heroes, Professor Casagrande, invented a graphical procedure for us to find the pre-consolidation stress. Well, why do we need that? I mean, if I go back to this plot, it seems kind of obvious to me that, boy, my pre-consolidation stress is right there. It's right where the slope of my line changes. Well, here's the bad news, folks. Real consolidation curves from real soils don't look like that. They look like this curve right here. And it's not so obvious to see where the point of curvature changes or, or where that, that curviness changes. So the slope between the recompression line and the virgin compression line uh, occurs. So Casa Grande developed a graphical method that can be used to find that pre-consolidation stress. Step one, we're going to find the point on this curve that represents the maximum curvature, the maximum curviness. So we can see that this line, this consolidation curve, seems to get the curviest right about at that point. And what I want to do <clears throat> is I'm going to then draw, just eyeballing it, and with a straight edge, I'm going to draw a tangent line to that point of maximum curvature. Step number two, I'm then going to draw a horizontal line right through that point of maximum curvature. Step number three, I'm going to look at this angle between lines one and line two that I drew. And I'm going to eyeball a bisector. I'm just going to try to cut that angle right in half. Whoop. So I'm going to draw that bisector. Step number four, I'm going to come down on the virgin compression line and I'm going to draw a straight line using a straight edge. And that straight line is going to extend up, 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 just like that. 
Step number five and the final step, where that virgin compression extension line crosses my bisector, we say that that stress is the pre-consolidation stress for the soil. So what are the different causes of overconsolidated soil? There's lots of different things that can overconsolidate soil. Overconsolidation occurs when the soil was loaded more in its past than it is currently. So one mechanism is erosion. Uh, maybe in the past there was more, uh, say, sand on top of the clay, but over time this sand got eroded and taken away by wind or water or whatever. So it unloaded the clay and all of a sudden we have clay that's feeling less stress than it did in its past. Uh, another pretty common um, tech, uh, method for overconsolidating soil is if I have a glacier. Say I had a really thick glacier that moved over the soil and loaded it. But then the climate changed, the glacier melted, and as a result the soil isn't feeling that load from that glacier anymore. A third method is rising groundwater. So if I have rising groundwater, we learned that because effective stress is total stress minus pore pressure, if the groundwater rises, then a little point of soil that's in there is going to feel more pore pressure. And if it's feeling more pore pressure, um, that basically means that effective stress has to essentially go down in order for the equilibrium to occur. And so if the effective stress goes down, then the soil can become overconsolidated. And last, but certainly not least, there's a, a mechanism called desiccation. Desiccation is where a soil becomes wet, but then it dries out. And when the soil dries out, the double layers in the clay particles become extremely thin and the soil particles start to get highly attracted to one another such that they bind themselves together really, really, really tightly. So tightly that it can feel like a piece of rock or gravel. And so those particles are so tightly packed because of that, that double layer interaction and those stresses that they're feeling enormous amounts of stress. And so it's not uncommon that if I were to plot, um, say, with depth, if I were to plot over consolidation ratio and say this was the ground surface, so I'm just going down, it's not uncommon to see this type of behavior where over consolidation ratio increases the closer I get to the ground surface. And the reason that occurs is because the ground closer to the ground surface has desiccated. All right. So one thing that's really important that we need to understand is what happens when um, we have disturbance of the clay samples that we bring back to the lab and we put in a consolidation test. Well, if we disturb the soil fabric, then the record of the stresses that's in that soil fabric becomes really difficult to read, such that if this line that's shown right here represents a really good sample that's, that's not very disturbed, you can see, wow, that's really easy to see that pre-consolidation stress. Okay, well, if I disturb the soil fabric in any way and I run a test, then my consolidation curve might look like that. If I really disturb my soil sample, then my consolidation curve might look like that. And it becomes more and more difficult to interpret and to correctly, um, interp uh, and to correctly estimate what my pre-consolidation stress of that soil is because my, my soil fabric has been so disturbed. And so the trend that we see is that with increasing disturbance of our soil fabric, we get smashed and, and pretty much garbage consolidation curves. So the name of the game, folks, 
is to collect as undisturbed soil samples as you possibly can get. If you really want bang for your buck and to get high quality consolidation settlement estimates, then you need to spend the money to get undisturbed soil samples back to the lab. Because if you do that, you're going to be able to get really nice consolidation curves from which you can get really reliable estimates of your pre-consolidation stress. Without that, you are just basically throwing darts at a board in the dark. So some engineers want to try to correct these smushed consolidation curves and get them back to an equivalent undisturbed consolidation curve, something that they think represents truly undisturbed soil from the field. So another geotechnical legend by the name of Schmertmann developed a correction method to, to correct these um, disturbed consolidation curves to equivalent field consolidation curves. So the method that he recommended is, a, is basically a four-step approach. The first step is, uh, say, say here's my consolidation curve plotted here um, that we got from the lab test. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to extend the virgin compression line down to a void ratio equal to 40% of the initial void ratio. So in this particular case, my initial void ratio was equal to 1. So I want to extend my void ratio down to 40% of that, or 0.4. So we just extend it down like that. Step number two. We're going to draw a horizontal line from um, coordinate. Remember, these are, um, whoops, I'm sorry. These are x, y coordinates. So um, in turn, and this is on a log linear scale here. So x coordinate of 0 0.01. Why not 0? Well, because there is no 0 value on a log scale. From 0 0.01 in E0 to whatever my actual stress is in the ground uh, that I believe is in the ground. So this right there, guys, that is the geostatic stress of the soil in the ground. That's our best estimate of what its actual uh, effective stress is in the ground. So in this particular case, for this little example, we're saying I believe that the effective stress of the soil in the ground is equal to 0 0.3 tons per square foot. That's step number two. Step number three, using the same slope as the rebound curve, that's this portion of the curve I'm highlighting in red. Using that same slope, we're going to draw a line from coordinate um, sigma uh, sigma prime E naught, that's this point that I'm highlighting in red right there, until it reaches um, sigma prime P. So basically we're just going to take that same slope and we're going to transmit it up to here. Where did I get sigma prime P? Well I got it from the graphical procedure from Casa Grande that we talked about earlier. Next step, we're going to draw a line from point 3, that's this point right here, the sigma prime p point, to the end point of the virgin compression line down here. Like that. So now this purple line that I've drawn represents um, a, a, an equivalent field corrected consolidation curve, assuming that we didn't disturb the soil at all. How accurate is it? Uh, we don't really know. And that's why few engineers use it today, but some engineers do. And so if you ever want to develop these field corrected curves, this is a way to do it. Now let's talk a little bit about some properties of these curves, okay? The first property I want to point out is if I were to get the slope of the virgin compression line, this is just the slope of the virgin compression line. 
we call it the compression index and we label it C sub C. Now wait a minute, you're going to go, didn't we use a C sub C before? Wasn't it the coefficient of gradation when we dealt with sieve analyses? Yes, it was. But we're geotechnical engineers and we like to confuse ourselves sometimes. So we have two C sub C variables. C sub C means the coefficient of gradation, but it also means the compression index if we're talking about settlement. So the C sub C is just the slope, guys, of the verging compression line. Now it's the slope of the verging compression line on the field corrected curve if I had a field corrected curve, or it's the slope of the line on just my lab curve if I didn't bother to do my field correction. So you see, it's just rise over run, everybody. Change in void ratio, that's my rise, over change in my log of stresses, that's my run. And because we're dealing with logs, we can do some logarithmic algebraic properties and simplify it this way. So that's the compression index. Now if I want the slope of the rebound, we call that the recompression index. And that is simply the slope of the line on my rebound curve that I'm highlighting in red right now. And again, that's just rise over run, change in void ratio over change in log of stresses that correspond to those void ratios. So we're just getting the slope of the line in log linear space. We label the recompression index as C sub R. R meaning recompression. So these are what we call settlement parameters, C sub C, C sub R, and we're going to use these parameters to predict the magnitude of settlement that we're going to get from some induced stress that we apply to the soil. So we'll hang on to those definitions. We're going to use those in, a, in, the, next, um, in the next lecture. So that wraps things up for this particular lecture, folks. Thanks for your attention. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.